Hello, I'm Thelma Larman and welcome to the Tubcast, the very first podcast dedicated to cynic philosophy and the art of simple living. Enjoy! Hi, I'm Kevin Patrick, your co-host for today's episode, which is episode two of the Cynic Tubcast. I'm joined today by Phil Summers and special guest host Rory Buchanan. Phil, how are things going with you today? Great, thank you. It's a lovely morning here in New Zealand, and now it's good to be uh, having a conversation with you and Rory over in Texas, just to round out the cosmopolitan nature. I know we're missing today Don and Talma. It's being summertime over the your time of the uh, your hemisphere. That is to be understandable. So we've still got a cosmopolitan nature feel to our episode today. And Rory, you're joining us from Houston, correct? Yes, from Houston. It's a fine day in Houston, Texas, Kevin. Thank you for having me. I look forward to our discussion about Antisthenes. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. And I think Antisthenes doesn't get nearly as much play, especially in modern discussions, as Diogenes does or even Crates. So it should be an interesting episode. Absolutely. All right, thanks guys for joining. Phil, do you want to go ahead and start us out? Yeah, so Antisthenes is a, uh, it sometimes referred to as a first cynic and at other times it's referred to as a proto-cynic. You know, he spoke very similar to Diogenes, but he lived quite a different life. And I think, hence, that gives him uh, two different titles, being a proto-cynic and, a, and uh, the first cynic. What do you think uh, about that, Rory? Yes, I agree. That does sort of provide a unique perspective on Antisthenes' career in relation to Diogenes's. But I think that one thing we can do very clearly at the beginning is understand that Antisthenes was a complex individual and his thinking can't really be reduced to a few simple categories like a lot of scholars try to do. His philosophy of language and his ethics are very complex and, and deserve consideration. Although they're more formal than Diogenes's, they have a lot to promise too, even though Diogenes is by far more entertaining. Antisthenes isn't without his moments though, he's got some great little stories about him and Plato and has some sly remarks about a bunch of people. I, I like some of the crayon there, he's, he's definitely quick-witted and um, this seems to be quite common amongst the cynics, so he has at least got that, that is, there is that recurring theme of quick-wittedness and making fun of people, that's definitely a theme amongst most of the cynics that we, we know of. Absolutely. As a student of Socrates, it's uh, it's very important, isn't it? Because he uh, he gets mentioned in a, a, a couple of different dialogues, Xenophon's, Xenophon's dialogue. Well, we're talking about whether or not Antisthenes counts as a proto-cynic or the first cynic. And I'm not sure that it's a distinction that the cynics themselves would have cared about. I think Desmond discusses that cynicism isn't a school in the same way that the academics or the Stoics or the Megarians or anyone else were. He argues that it's a perennial philosophy and it comes up everywhere and at many different times. And that there's these, you know, almost cross-cultural trends. So when Alexander heads over to India, and they talk about where they see the uh, gymnosophists, the, the naked wise men of India. And there's also discussion later on about similar kinds of folks in Ethiopia. And that sort of seems proto cyniky So as you pop around all of that part of the world, there seems to be this recurring upwelling of ideas which are, if not exactly, definitely reminiscent of cynicism. So I think they all kind of fit into that genre. But one of the things that we talked about is this lineage of Socrates to Antisthenes to Diogenes. And that's, I mean, that's, that's the, the historical tie to it, but I guess that's challenged position, if I understand correctly. Yes, absolutely. Donald Dudley challenges that position. He argues that Antisthenes in antiquity had his own school that was principally devoted to logical study. And while I agree with you, Kevin, that definitely cynicism and proto-cynicism are ubiquitous in world cultures, what's unique about Antisthenes and what I think tends to throw people off is that even if he is a cynic, he's a unique cynic in that he's not only con concerned with ethics, he's also interested in, in logic and in theology or some sort of physics. So there's a lot of diversity in his thought that we don't see in other cynics. Yeah, well, he holds from Socrates that uh, virtue is the only good, and this was passed down to the to the cynics, and we see Diogenes living this life, and then we also have it handed into the Stoics. So they took up that position that virtue is the only good, you know, putting them at odds with somebody like um, the Epicureans or or Aristotle or whoever, but um. They all, there's this consistency of virtue is the only good between the Cynic Stoics and Antisthenes, 
Antisthenes, as far as I'm aware, he disdained pleasure, which was, you know, very similar to the to the cynics. But I'm not sure what he did with his wealth and and what sort of family he came from. I know that he was. Uh, I'm not sure if he gave it up to live on the streets or if he maintained some sort of residence. And um, the later cynics did tend to give up any idea or any any claim to wealth. Crates got rid of all his wealth. Diogenes never tried to reclaim it after he was exiled, and so on. And he lived to. Uh, I'm not sure. Of his the historical antisthenes at like uh, any giving up of wealth. Are you aware of any, Rory? Well, Louis Navia in his work on Antisthenes talks about Antisthenes as sort of a genteel, urbane sophist in the first part of his career, and then when he converted to cynicism or he began to live more frugally and ascetically, he maintained a residence, but he didn't have many furnishings. And he, at the banquet that Xenophon recorded, said that. I do partake of external goods, but only when necessary, and that's why they're so valuable to me. So he attributed value to a quality, not an actual entity like a possession, which, which is very cynic-like. But he didn't go so far as many cynics did as to just get rid of the possession altogether. So it, I agree, it's, it's a different sort of cynicism, but it's still in the same vein of thought. Has there been any discussion about how that comes around to the latter Roman cynics, who are generally seen as a, a paler shadow of their Greek forebears? So we have folks who definitely have stuff, uh, like Junian later on, and those later Roman cynics. That, I guess, maybe seems more in line with how Antonines may have lived originally than may maybe Diogenes or Crates at, you know, at all are outliers. I agree. I, I think that there are some uh, instances of outliers. Antisthenes, in terms of uh, Roman cynicism, seems to have a lot more compatibility. There were some cynics who partook of the practice of Pharisia, but they also wanted to maintain the Roman concept of dignity or gravitas in their speech. So they were sort of moderate cynics. That, that was a cultural innovation. So I guess part of the question is, when we're talking about the, this lineage, that one of the assertions is the Stoics it's a conceit or something to claim legitimacy as a heritage from Socrates they might not have had otherwise, since it is kind of a syncretic school. I mean, there's Megarian logic, there's these other things working in there, so as a claim to perceived legitimacy. But I'm actually going to argue that that doesn't really matter. If we're interested in a pure historical perspective of who taught who and who did what, that's one, one issue. But if we're talking about philosophy and ethics, it's a separate issue. And the reason I think it doesn't matter, especially within the cynic school, is, is the ethical and moral end goal. So within the various rea of Diogenes, we have a story that he held his breath until he died, that he died from eating an uncooked octopus, and that he died on the plantation land of some rich person to whom he was sold after he raised this fellow's uh, kids. All three of these things can't be true. And it doesn't really matter, because the purpose at this point, Diogenes has, has morphed from a historical figure to almost a mythological figure, or at least a cultural character. So cynicism in some ways has broken from this modern Western of we need to know exactly what happened when so that we know what's true so that we can do what's right. I think that, especially since cynicism seems more a parable oriented, that it really doesn't matter whether or not that lineage is true or not. What matters is the truth that we divine from those lessons, if that makes sense. I completely agree, Kevin. Well, and also, a unique feature of the Cynic uh, tradition is that there are no formal schools. There was no Gadarene school, there was no formal Athenian school. So the concept of succession in Cynicism really can't be compared to the concept of succession in more uh, formal schools or schools that incorporate traditional schools and academic settings. It just doesn't equate. I think also today we don't care so much about being linked to Socrates because yeah, he's the, he's the grandfather of Western philosophy, but culturally back then, there was a tradition of always linking somebody was always a student of somebody else. And uh, it was really important then. So I, I know it doesn't matter to us because we can see all this stuff, but I, I think it was important to them to, to have this, this pedigree uh, established back then, culturally, you know, relative. There's also the entire, entirely selfish reason to sort of ignore Socrates, because then we have to pay way too much attention to Plato, more than he deserves. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's, a, that's another thing in itself, isn't it? <laughs> but that antagonism between the Platonic ideas and the Cynico-Stoic ideas is, is not a, a new one. 
Uh, I think that we find a lot of friction and umbrage there. We do, and I think it's because of Antisthenes, because of Diogenes, that we that Plato became who he was. He was never, ever, you know, to be born a genius, I suppose, is quite a rare thing. And uh, you can't just assume that Plato has the respect he does, maybe not the respect he does, you know, in philosophy departments around the world. But the only reason he became like that was through this, this interactions with people like Antisthenes and Diogenes. Antisthenes was once told, he was told that Plato spoke ill of him. And he replied, it's a royal privilege to do well and to be evil spoken of. He just had all these interactions with them, Antisthenes that is. All of these sharpened each other's wit, I suppose. Sharpened each other's thoughts. Created. We can, we can thank the cynics like Antisthenes for creating Plato and his ideas of forms and everything that came out of it from these interactions with somebody like Antisthenes, possibly. That's very true. Plato's Euthydemus is supposed to be in response to some doctrines of Antisthenes. The doctrine of non-contradiction, which was a part of his logic and in metaphysics or physics, is sort of present very strongly there. And although in the dialogue Plato supposedly answers sophists, you can see that there are some caricature doctrines that are very convincing that purportedly came from Antisthenes. So there was a lot of substantial intellectual conflict Plato was dealing with. I, I completely agree. Two points, just for folks who might be new to the Hellenic discussion. So the word sophist in modern times is usually a pejorative, and it's a way to talk about pretenders to philosophy, although that emerged from, from a rhetorical style and something that, that was more for, uh, firm at the time. Uh, so that just might be a little thing to keep in mind, just like when we talk about Stoic, Cynic, Epicurean, and the uh, degradation of the meaning of those words, that's part of it. But something that uh, came to my mind, Rory, you mentioned that it's probably inappropriate to think of cynicism as a school per se in the same way that we do for the other schools. And there's definitely, I think, an interesting crea that ties into that, this idea that Diogenes came to Antisthenes um, and desired to to be his student, and, and he was run off uh, with, with a stick, right? That's... Uh, he's chased off. So even then, um, at the very foundations of what we might call the cynic school, is Antisthenes trying very, very hard not to have one. That's right. Well, Antisthenes said that his virtue from philosophy was the ability to converse with himself. So why does he need students? He would just sit and, and discuss with himself, I suppose. That's that's a rare virtue, but very admirable, too. That beating away with, oh, with the, of students, with his staff... Next, that comes up as a career somewhere quite uh, interestingly with Diogenes. We can see Antisthenes' logic in uh, the Cynics too. Diogenes has a real interest in naming things, like the demagogue he names the lackey of the mob. That sort of comes from Antisthenesian nominalism, this idea that there aren't any universals or ideas like the ones Plato invented. There's also that Sharia where Diogenes and Plato have the exchange over the forms. Diogenes sees the cups, but he doesn't see cupness. That's very Antisthenesian, this idea that there's no universal idea. And that definitely carries through to Stoicism as well, this denial of the universal forms. Definitely. Um, the, you know, t t taken straight from Diogenes Laertius on Antisthenes, uh, it says, he used to laugh at Plato as conceited. Accordingly, once when there was a fine procession seeing a horse neighing, he said to Plato, I think too you would be a very frisky horse. I don't know, he's just making fun of him the whole time, but it, it's, it's coming from Plato and his ideas of form, you know, that the, uh, the accusation of being conceited, dealing in philosophy that's not tangible, not focusing on virtue, I suppose. I don't know how to say that in a different way, but I, I think these are the... Uh, this is the battleground, and it's the same for the Stoics as well. Um, I think that they, they kind of like to, to deal with ethics and live in the real world. They just do it a slightly different way to the Cynics, who really live and practice and train the body and the mind. And there's no place for, there's no place for the forms or any of those other uh, Platonic ideas when, you, when you're trying to live a good, virtuous life. Rory, do you think it's fair to lay the idea of cynic ponos on the ascetic lifestyle of Antisthenes later on? Yes. In uh, Louis Navia's book on Antisthenes, 
there are some references that Antisthenes took on hardships that he deprived himself of his earlier lifestyle. I don't. I I do know that in the Doxography and Diogenes Laertes, Antisthenes says that there are two kinds of training. There are traditional labors, and then there's obscurity, which is not a technical get out and actually get physically exerted kind of labor that Diogenes would practice, but it's more of an intellectual labor that might have some physical aspects. If you're obscure, you're not going to have as nice possessions. Your lifestyle may not be as as opulent. You'll have some set setbacks because of that, definitely as a philosopher. So I agree. The ponos does come from Antisthenes to some degree. At the danger of introducing a, a tangent, Phil, do you remember when we were discussing in the introduction to the Cynic epistles um, that they classify Musonius Rufus as a cynic, um, although the common conception is him firmly as a stoic Musonius also describes two kinds of training. One is training of the body, and the other is training of the soul. And then he kind of dismissively says, I'm not going to enumerate which is which. You can either figure that out or find someone else to tell you. Um, But I wonder if there's an interesting parallel there, and maybe that's why they categorized him as such. I don't think that's the, the only reason. No, because even firmly stoic people like Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius led you know, Marcus Aurelius did try and sleep in a cot until his mother dissuaded him of it. Um, you know, he wore the wool, wool uh, woolen cloaks, uh, or sleep with a woolen blanket. They're not particularly comfortable. It's not like fine Egyptian cotton or whatever uh, the emperor of the world had back then. So this, their practice of training the body to train the mind, I think was a, was a big part of Stoicism back then as well. We may have lost it nowadays, and we do occasional... Stoics today do occasional hardships to remind them of that, but they don't do the regular hardship. It's not part of daily life. So I don't think that's the basis of him being a cynic. I think it is the the focus on virtue, and there isn't as much talk of physics and logic, I suppose. And, you know, the schools are so related. It's hard to... It is at times hard to tell them apart, and at other times the the differences are, are astonishing. But I think... This is why Antisthenes is an important person to discover. As a proto-cynic, he doesn't quite fit the, nece- uh, the necessary qualification for being the first cynic. Diogenes is kind of seen by Lewis uh, Nabia as being uh, the grandfather or the father of so- Stoicism and Cynicism. And Antisthenes you know, is just the link to Socrates. And Socrates is obviously the, the godfather of all Greek philosophy. So there's this hardship that follows through Diogenes, through to, into, into Stoicism as well. So it, it's, it ought to be there the whole time, and I don't think it's that by itself, no. Well, I, I agree that hardship alone is not enough to say that Antisthenes is substantially linked to cynicism. The commitment to virtue is very important, too. And as we've mentioned before, we have sort of logical and metaphysical correlates that come from this very strong commitment. One interesting point comes from William Desmond's book on the origins of ancient cynicism. He talks about the quasi-Parnamenian attitudes of Antisthenes, and Antisthenes had understood the Parnamenian concept of the one or the monad as something of the ideal form of the sage, and we see that exemplified in cynic thinking too. That's a very strong point of virtue, self-sufficiency, the attitude that you don't need the economy or social structure to survive. You can do it on your own if you need to, and you actually should in some respects. So that is also a very important aspect, I believe, that stems from Antisthenes' commitment to virtue, this metaphysical aspect. It gets ignored a little bit because people tend to think Antisthenes wasn't very smart, I suppose, but he really was. He was a very sharp guy. One of the things that Desmond also talks about is the cynicizing Stoics. And I, I've argued in the past that when we're having this kind of discussion, it's better to think of a, a continuum or a line in which you have cynicism on one end and Stoicism on the other, and there's various spots in between. Um, Desmond calls Epictetus a cynicizing Stoic. And there's definitely this difference between those who adopt the tribon, those who wear the uniform of the philosopher, who live rough and train themselves, and the strictly academic uh, philosophers. So I think that that's just, an, in this sort of discussion, a good thought model to think about it as, as more of a continuum than firm, rigorous schools. If, as a central idea, going back to what I already said, if you followed that virtue is the only good, I think you can trace that back to Socrates. Antisthenes says it, Diogenes says it, the Stoics adopt it, 
and this is what separates them from the Epicureans. And if I, if, if I can remember rightly, I don't know much about Aristotle, but Aristotle said that you might need friends or a bit of money to be happy. So you need these other things to help qualify. So virtue isn't the only good to him. There's some other little goods that help achieve happiness. So, And I don't even know about the other schools myself. I don't know enough about them. But the, the virtue is the only good is, is definitely... What, say a core principle that's been been passed down from Socrates to cynicism and then into to Stoicism. I think that's it's got to be the core. If you could boil anything else down, that follows as well. I'm not sure, but virtue is the only good. Believing that and living that that's the key, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, a lot of the resilience and endurance of the cynics comes from this idea that. It is just a quality you possess within yourself, virtue. And no external good can take that from you or add anything to it. It's entirely self-produced. It's, it's a strong generator of confidence. And I would say that definitely distinguishes the cynic and, and the stoic to some degree from the Aristotelian, who's always concerned with wealth and opulence and decoration. There's the Charia of Crates when he rescued, well, not so much rescued, but converted Metricles from the school of Aristotle to cynicism. And he says that Metricles was much happier as a cynic because he didn't have all of the constraints of Aristotelianism on him anymore. He didn't have to provide for the, their luscious feasts and their rich uh, customs. Or customs. So it, it was a, a big relief, and I think all cynics enjoy that. So if we're going to say that virtue is the key, that virtue is the only good is the thing that links all these schools what is virtue just for people who haven't quite worked it out because it's an english word or whatever wherever it's derived from that we don't really use in everyday language so i think kevin you're probably best well the word that, that we're talking about in translation is edite and it usually gets translated as virtue um some have argued that it's better to translate it more as human excellence or, or excellence in, in some way and we're talking specifically about human excellence so what does that mean to be an excellent human and, uh, of course, the living according to nature injunction is how we discover that. So when we're talking about virtue with the cynics, there's not really these subcategories that we see in Stoicism. Stoicism, kind of like Christianity, Christianity's got seven virtues, I think, and I can't name them all, but um, that Stoicism has four cardinal virtues. And uh, the cynics, they just seem to have one, just virtue. They just talk about virtue. And, just, and so it's just being an excellent human being the best good in the sense of right and wrong good human is that right well i think the idea is a bit more complex so technically the stoic conception is there is only one kind of virtue but it's the prerogative of the sage that the rest of us are simply making progress towards so you've got the layman who is by definition insane then you have the prokopton who's making progress and you have sophos who who is who's got it and you can see virtue in various ways. It's phronesis, it's practical wisdom. There's a book called Stoic Virtue by Christoph Yedin. And this idea of, of the unitary nature of virtue is definitely a little bit hard to, to grok, especially with, strictly within Stoic vitalism or monism, where virtue is a body and it's, it's, a, it's a thing. So it's, it's a bit more complex than to say that the Stoics have the four cardinal virtues, temperance, uh, courage, justice and wisdom, specifically practical wisdom. It's a bit more complex than that. So I think that in, in this typical way of needing to go in and, and describe a bit more uh, that Stoicism has, I don't think they would actually disagree generally with the idea of there is only virtue as a single thing. True. It's just that we see this word a lot, and uh, understanding it is one thing. Antisthenes from Diogenes Lotius again, uh, he said that he used to insist that virtue was a thing which might be taught. Absolutely. So it can be taught or can it be learnt from books? It should it only be able to be taught. Is it something simple that anybody can can learn or does it take years of study and study and study and study and books and books and books kind of like um, other schools of philosophy or sophists might teach? Yet in his book talks about uh, virtue as a form of episteme, so a kind of knowledge. And that harkens back to Socrates, that, that once you know virtue and you really know it, you cannot help but do it. Um, and that any failure up until then is basically a misapprehension or a misunderstanding. At least that, that's my understanding of that lineage. That, that it, it does constitute a form of knowledge that we see through practical wisdom. 
and as soon as you actually understand it, that's when it falls when, when it all falls into place, and one might find themselves even momentarily for a smidgen of a time a sage. And this idea of achieving that even for a small moment of time, if it, even if it passes, that is eudaimonia. That that is the goal. And it's just as good to have it for that smidgen of a second if you actually end up as it is to have it for, for your whole life. At least that's the Stoic conception there. there there's no distinction, no time preference. Um, if it's there, it's there, and that's it. Antisthenes was a Socratic, and part of Socratic intellectualism is very much so teaching that virtue is, is learnable. But his idea of the mechanics of virtue was a little different. He did believe that there was a propositional content to virtue, but because he was a nominalist, he didn't believe in universal predicates. It wasn't propositional in our sense of the term propositional. It was just a one-word sort of thing, like virtue or temperance or endurance. So Susan Price, in her work on the Socratics, argues that what Antisthenes did was he chose passages from mythology and had his students study those as a form of training the mind. But the greater part of virtue acquisition, Antisthenes' opinion, was physical. It was labors. He thought that virtue was a deed and not a word. So there was sort of a propositional content, but not so much. And also, cynics in general disagreed with the Stoics in that they denied progress. They believed that people were either wise or they weren't, and when you became wise, you were wise entirely. You were a sage. So there were really only sages and fools. There was no middle class. To go back to that mythological thing, the importance of Hercules to cynicism, the 12 labors of his were obviously then considered virtuous or examples of virtue. Would that be right? Yes, absolutely. Ponos is largely derived from the mythical labors of Hercules. Some of the cynic virtues were exemplified in specific labors, like the cleaning of the Augean stables, exemplifies sort of a a, an ability to continue a difficult task. And the general teaching method of Antisthenes was different from Plato's. Plato wrote dialogues, but Antisthenes wrote allegories. Both philosophers didn't just explicitly say, here's what virtue is. They let people discover it on their own, but they had radically different ways of presenting it. The the fundamental invention of his was this ability to separate the literal word from some greater signification. And so he would read, an ex for example, a passage in mythology where Nestor lifted a cup of wine, and he would say that it's not necessarily that Nestor was just a good drinker, it was that he had the moral ability to indulge in drinking and not lose his temperance or not lose his manliness. So Antisthenes as a monotheist and a reformer of culture wanted to get away from what he perceived to be the immorality of the Greek polytheism in, in currency. So he devised this new system of interpretation, like sort of like biblical exegesis in present day thought. And it was con entirely consisted of this linguistic operation in which he would take a word or phrase from mythology and reinvent it in his own thinking. And from that, we have a lot of cynic transvaluation of ideas like labor and s slavery and freedom. These things take on new significations that are radically opposed to culture. And the impetus for that may very well have come from Antisthenes' radical interpretation of text. Fascinating. So we don't know for sure if Diogenes and Antisthenes ever met, although it's likely. I, I find this crea, the story in, in Diogenes Laertius, to, to kind of be a nice conclusion, because it ties up Antisthenes and shows the importance of or just the, the conversations that may or may not have occurred between the two of them. But it less so whether or not it occurred, it le it's less important whether or not it occurred to the, to the value, to the teaching that it holds. It reads, he died of some disease, and while he was ill, Diogenes came to visit him and said to him, have you need of a friend? Once too he came to see him with the sword in his hand, and when Antisthenes said, Who can deliver me from this suffering? He, pointing to the sword, said, This can. But he rejoined, I said from suffering, but not from life. So, I think what, what I particularly like about this is that um, it shows up again in Nietzsche, um, many years later, and Nietzsche says that the cynic, more than any other philosopher, clings to life. And Antisthenes is not as famous as Diogenes. We don't see him in the artwork that we see in Diogenes, but he's still <coughs> relevant, he's still important, he's still discussed many, many, many years later with the like, by the likes of Nietzsche. And um, 
it definitely is a feature of the school that, that they, they, they do love life. They're not cynic in the, the modern sense that they despise everybody's intentions and, and they distrust everybody. There's a very positive underlying to cynicism, uh, ancient, ancient Greek cynicism. And you can see the passing of the batons from Antisthenes to Diogenes in that quote there. Absolutely, that's a fascinating Cheria to want to be dismissed from labor but not from life, especially considering Antisthenes' emphasis on labor as sort of the fundamental means of moral progress. I, there's so much there, but because of the quality of the evidence and the amount of the evidence, I don't think we'll ever be able to fully explain. But just the same, it's it's still fascinating. Um, definitely. Um, and the fact that, I don't know, if it contrasts at all with, with the uh, Stoic position, because sometimes in the Stoic forums I've seen Stoics talk about Stoicism and suicide and whether or not it, be, it is in accordance with nature or if it's not, or all sorts of things there and if it uh if this aspect of cynicism crossed it over to uh well my understanding is that life is not a good in and of itself within stoic thought um it is of course the context for which virtue occurs or doesn't occur but it's not in and of itself a good so mere longevity is not valued over quality so if if a continued existence would make virtue slip then furthering your life would not not be the goal. So suicide is often brought up, and if you look at folks like Cato, Seneca, um, many of them are subjected to suicide um, by the law or by the, the tyrants of the day. And this isn't seen as an evil because they're sort of at a certain place. So for most folks, um, suicide is not an option. It's basically reserved for the sage or someone who's you know at that level of achievement. So in the modern context, if that's something one is considering, it's entirely reasonable to, to reach out and ask for help. And the uh, stoic acceptance of the idea of suicide for the sage um, shouldn't be interpreted as an endorsement for that act um, for modern practitioners, I would say, is a fair assessment of it. There's, there's some parallels with um, Diogenes. Yeah, Diogenes has a half a dozen different, story, different versions of his death. But when he chose to eat the octopus, which eventually killed him, he would have known eating a raw octopus probably wouldn't have been very good for him. The same as holding his breath. Like, people can't die from holding your breath because obviously you just pass out and wake up again. But um, this choosing to, to, to opt out in old age when you're no good to anybody, um, it, it, it's uh, when you start to rely on other people because you're no longer self-sufficient. Self-sufficiency is the key. You know, it's a very key theme to cynicism. And we see the gymnosophists um, that Alexander visited, they did the same thing on a burning pyre um, when they reached old age. And they, instead of relying on anybody else, they, they lit themselves on, jumped on a, a massive pyre. Just a thing that they did. We had a cynic, Peregrinus, do the same. Uh, he, was, he wasn't that old, though, so I think it was seen as a bit of a waste. But uh, he obviously felt that way. So in the vein of uh, Ponos and training, um, Diogenes statues, Rory, you have an interesting project in the works that kind of ties into that. Is that true? Yes, absolutely. I'm writing a cynic course, which will consist of 10 short prose pieces that will explore the major themes of cynicism and offer some examples of cynic labor to people who are interested in applying them in their own lives. And what kind of resources do you pull from uh, to produce something like that? I look into secondary scholarship and some of the primary sources. To some degree, I try to replicate the labors that occur in Diogenes Laertes, but I also offer modern versions. Some of it is speculative, but where speculation occurs, I clearly note that. But a lot of it, too, I, I try to maintain a traditional explanation that occurs in Stoic courses and materials on other schools of philosophy. I try to be pretty consistent when I can. So do you think such a thing like that will have um, some use or some value, not just for people who are interested in cynicism, but other sorts of philosophies as a way of life? Absolutely. Well, what's very important to cynicism, probably the fundamental attitude of cynicism is intentionality. And I, I believe, along with a lot of other philosophical thinkers, that intentionality is, is a great way of ensuring life satisfaction in many respects. So whether you're interested in cynicism or stoicism or virtually any other philosophy, you're going to have to pay attention to yourself, and hopefully that's the overall achievement of the course. And uh, when can we expect uh, versions of that for popular consumption? Well, uh, 
very soon. I would say within the next few days. Um, I've made a lot of progress and I'm excited to put it out there. It's going to be reviewed by the Cynic Facebook Group Administration and then disseminated to members and anyone else who's, who's interested. I'm looking forward to some feedback. I've created a blog called The Cynosarges while I'll post it uh, for the public to view. That's a clever bastardly name. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, is this going to be freely available or is it a pay to play kind of deal? It's, it's going to be free. I won't charge anything. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. Uh, I think that a lot of people find that practical practical exercises are something they're looking for. And for many of, of those of us who are still identify as Stoics, that's our attraction to cynicism, is that kind of praxis. So I'm looking forward to your course, Rory. Thanks for working on that. Thank you. I'm enjoying it. All right. Well, I think that will wrap us up for today. I want to thank everyone for joining us for the second episode of the Cynic Tubcast. I want to thank my co-hosts, Phil Summers and Rory Buchanan, for their participation this evening. And hopefully, fate permitting, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.